Hello and welcome to this month's space exploration news, keeping you up to date with the latest efforts to slip the surly bonds of Earth. And we'll start with Jenny. Yes, so first up for my space exploration news this month, I am going to China because at the start of June, China launched a three-person crew to complete assembly of the Tiangong space station. Now, this latest mission is slated to last for about six months, and it'll see two laboratory modules join onto the existing living space. One module will launch in July, and then one in October. And then by the end of the year, the space station should be fully operational, and it'll be reasonably comparable to Mia in terms of scale. We're unlikely to see international collaboration on the same scale that we currently see on the International Space Station. China's unfortunately made that pretty clear, but they are open to some collaboration. So perhaps running other countries' experiments or seeing other nations spend short stints on board, you know, maybe some tourists, things like that. And then, of course, you know, we're not sure what experiments China is going to be conducting on board. But seeing as they have plans to launch a crewed lunar mission by the end of this decade with a view to eventually building a lunar base, my bet would be research pertaining to those goals. So long duration space exploration, the impact that, that has on the human body, extracting resources, growing food, radiation exposure, and so on. And then talking of the moon, you can see the theme of my background. I've uh, chosen it very carefully <laughs> for, for this uh, for this space exploration news. But talking of the moon, it is probably worth talking about Artemis One quite a bit this time. Mm. Uh, I think there are some interesting things going on. So Artemis One is, of course, the first mission as part of the Artemis program, which is going to be sending people back to the moon, which I'm so excited for <laughs> because you know Apollo was before my time, and I know that Paul like doesn't really get on with Artemis, but for me, oh, that's, and, like, that's not thing. that's not fair. That's not. I fair. think that I'm, is fair because I'm skeptical like, of the like, time mm. frame. I'm skeptical of the time frame. Mm. <laughs> okay hmm. all right well see see what you think of what i've got to say about it here now so we're talking artemis one artemis one is the first mission and um they're hoping to launch that later this year but before they do artemis one they have to, they have to do a wet dress rehearsal test so this is not the first attempt of this wet dress rehearsal this is kind of like they were turn to the launch pad to try and do this this wet dress rehearsal and so I think the first thing to kind of unpack is what is a wet dress rehearsal because it's just a bit of jargon right so this is when the engineers they basically run through everything that they would do before launch without actually hitting the launch button and it does involve everything you know from wheeling the thing out from the vehicle assembly building testing switches communication lines you know putting the capsule through its cases, launch procedures, all the timings, right the way through to the most critical part, which is, of course, fueling and then draining the rocket. And they do that draining just in case the launch has to be scrubbed on the day, you know, because of weather, anything like that. And it's this refueling and draining procedure that is causing all of the problems for Artemis at the minute. And so then we should talk about this kind of like return and all of the problems that have happened with this wet rehearsal because I'm not really sure how many times they've attempted it now. Um, the, the it was originally supposed to be in March of this year, right, 2022. Yeah. And then that woman's like delayed until the beginning of April due to pressurization and fan issues. And then the April one was like cancelled halfway through because they sort of half filled it with liquid oxygen. And then the, the liquid oxygen temperatures were exceeded because it has to be maintained at very, very low temperatures. And then that was caused by valve problems. So we've had fans and pressures and valves and there's like, you know, all sorts of stuff going wrong with this like wet dress rehearsal. But the key point is that the Artemis rocket and the Orion capsule they, have, they were wheeled back to the vehicle assembly building, tinkered with, wheeled out again on the 6th of June, and NASA have now set a date of the 18th of June. So, you know, around when this is going out. And this is the kind of targeted date for beginning the wet dress rehearsal. And it's going to take a long time. I did not mm. realise how long a wet dress rehearsal yeah. takes. 45 hours. That's like two days. Yeah. So yeah. when, yeah. When it comes to watching this, you know, because NASA will live stream it, they always do. The 20th of June is the date that you want. That's the interesting day because that's when they're checking the fuel on board. That is the one that is causing all of the problems so far. So, you know, everything else 
has has been fine. But yeah, that, that's going to be the interesting day to see if they've actually solved these pressurization, the valve issues, you know, the fan issues, mm-hmm. stuff mm-hmm. like that. But then as to when Artemis One is actually going to launch, you know, so Artemis One is going to be an uncrewed test mission to the moon and back. The whole thing will take about a month, maybe 40 days. It depends when they launch. Well, honestly, it is anyone's guess because between the 26th of July and the 23rd of December this year, there are 73 launch opportunities <laughs> for Artemis One. <laughs> yeah, so it's, so it's, it, it's anyone's guess, like when it's actually going to happen, Artemis One. I mean, I'm really excited for it. I want this dress, wet dress rehearsal to work because if it does work, then, you know, we've got the more likelihood of it going sometime in the summer or something like that. But, uh, yeah. So what what do you guys think about this wet dress rehearsal? Is it going to work? Is it? What I mean, are you feeling? the last issue, I think, was was mainly the valves, wasn't it? The sticky valves. And, and, and I think Musk's even come out and said that, you know, there is a real problem with getting hold of good quality valves. Mm. Um, and you know he's he's trying to build the world's biggest rocket, so he's gonna have a lot of valves on that with thirty three rockets at the bottom, mm. uh, rocket engines at the bottom. He's probably taking up the world supply of good valves, so he's probably yeah, not helping. Yeah, it's, it's all his fault. <laughs> Aerojet rocket dying there, but yeah, I mean, the, the, I, I think exactly what you said there, Jen. The really exciting thing is if they get through this wet rehearsal, wet dress rehearsal, you've got seventy three potential launch windows in the next six months where it mm. could fly. It's not like, well, if it gets through this, then we can only really launch it in on the 3rd of October or we can launch it on the 17th of November. Mm. It's probably going to go. You know, it, it, this thing that we've been waiting for for so long, and now yeah. we're going to come back to Project Constellation, no doubt, at some point today. But ever since, you know, George Bush announced Project Constellation in, I think, 2003, we've had one architecture or another along these lines of the SLS and the Orion capsule that's, just been so exciting just waiting mm. for it and those dates slipping from the original 2020 day to 2022 and then now we're looking at 2026 probably maybe even later but we're getting mm. so much closer to that apollo that we never had that will be the safe apollo and it hopefully the safe apollo as safe as space flight can be mm. but also that sustained presence as well you know going to the moon mm. To potentially stay there i think that's really exciting it's, you know having the iss going around every 90 days is really sorry every 92 hours not 92 minutes uh, is really minutes, exciting yeah. but <laughs> no, that'll be a slow orbit or a big plan um but you know having <laughs> having people permanently know, on the right. runway, look up and go that's there are problem. people there yeah. or maybe even you yeah. know with a telescope being able to see a laser being shone out of a moon base or something how awesome would that be yeah just all, all the astronauts having a massive rave yeah <laughs> be like, all the telescopes <laughs> on the moon it's like we we see your disco ball <laughs> um, and don't forget i mean this this wet dress rehearsal apollo took many many attempts to get through its wet dress rehearsal Many yeah. attempts. I can't remember the, the figure off the top of my head, but it, it is loads. And yeah. as did the space shuttle, the first the first space yeah. shuttle. They, they I think took, three, four or five, wasn't it? Easily, mm. easily. I think the Apollo's even more than that. They, they, they mm. went through many, many attempts to get through yeah. this. Again, it's, it's that sort of building the safety, building. It's also building the procedures in that you've got a new prototype rocket and the ground crews and the people actually yeah. servicing the rocket and then going through the launch procedures they're actually working it out how to operate the thing anyway mm. it, it's yep. you know this is a brand new piece of kit essentially and yes it uses lots of old bits and pieces yeah. from shuttle and things like that but nonetheless it's a new system with you know so it's not something they're immediately going to go to just like l- dump on the launch pad and go yeah off it goes um i yeah, think falcon I think 9 took is... took like half a dozen attempts in it's it's sort of get through a wet dress rehearsal at the beginning mm. you know this is this is not an unusual thing and i think maybe I mean, that is being somewhat lost in the general sort of media perception. Because mm. the thing is, it's like Apollo was before my time. Uh, the first launches of the space shuttle were before my time. So, you know, I missed all of the this mm. wet dress rehearsal, rehearsal stage. And um, I don't think I was really following like SpaceX rockets and that mm. much when they were at that sort of early stage. Mm. So, you know, it is good to know that actually in context, the fact that has failed a few times is just part and parcel of the yeah. testing procedure yeah. and it's not to be super stressed about no 
No, you, you think about even like a you know a, an airliner or you know an aeroplane not putting in space. They go through taxiing trials. They go through the sort of various runs down the runway where they you know they mm-hmm. don't take off and they, they 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 sort of practice and they go through all these procedures and fueling and defueling and they, all craft like this do this. So this is nothing's unusual here. It's all very optimistic actually. It seems to be sort of you know on the right track. It will. I'm always certain this thing's going to fly this year. It, it will. We are going to see artists fly yeah. around the moon. And, you know, well, I think if you're good. saying it, Paul, with with your yeah. lot of scepticism, <laughs> I, th- I think that's probably the best indication we could get. Well, the hardware's there yeah. now. The hardware's there, and it, in effect, a lot of the all the hard stuff in terms of the engineering, the build, the integration, like that's done. Now it's just testing a new piece of kit. It's basically, it's like in the hands of the test pilots, in in a, in a kind of metaphorically. And mm. I think it will fly. It will fly now this year, and, and that's really exciting. So uh, got... I just hope that there's a butt ton of HD cameras on it. Yeah, oh, <laughs> I hope one. so. They must. They must. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. And so you've got another Artemis story to, to finish us off. I do, yeah. So for my final news story, it's another sort of Artemis-related one. And uh, this is all about the Artemis Accords. And big news is that France have now signed them, becoming the 20th country to do so. So, I mean, we should probably just take a little dive into what the Artemis Accords are. And these are sort of regulations that are setting out the rules for future lunar exploration. So a little bit like the Outer Space Treaty, but with like, how can I put this eloquently? some actual gumption and <laughs> enforcement <laughs> behind them. Because like the Outer Space Treaty uh, is, is just people say, oh yes, we won't use like space for war, but it's just agreement. There's nothing, yeah. there's mm. no real repercussions if someone was to kind of do something like that in space. But the idea with the Artemis Accords is to lay out some rules now before nations start going back to the moon to make sure that access is fair, other nations' work isn't going to be kind of interferes with, um, areas of historical importance like the Apollo landing sites are preserved, and it also stops countries exploiting lunar resources. So, you know, you can kind of use bits of the moon on the moon, but it prevents nations bringing back like a butt ton of moon rock or other as yet undiscovered precious minerals and then making a fortune, you know, just kind of ringing some little historical bells there of other uh, times that we've gone to yeah. foreign mm-hmm. places. Mm-hmm. But why do we care about France signing? Well, France is one of the major contributors to the European Space Agency, and they were really quite hesitant about kind of coming on board with the Artemis Accords. But now that they are, hopefully that will lead the way for other big players like Germany and India not China and Russia, unfortunately, they've already ruled themselves out of the game. But you know what? It would be nice to have some proper like space regulation for once, because I think like Meg Constellations are a perfect example where it's just gone horribly wrong. There are literally no rules protecting the dark night sky, you know, protecting access to science. And, you know, from an astronomy perspective, like a practical astronomy perspective, the situation is just, you know, it's rapidly deteriorating beyond mm. remedy. So I am all for NASA setting up these Artemis Accords, you know, trying to get some fair rules in place before everyone starts trampling all over the moon again. And if you were interested, the 20 nations that have signed it so far are, in alphabetical order, Australia, Bahrain, Brazil, Canada, Colombia, France, Israel, Italy, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Luxembourg, Mexico, New Zealand, Poland, Romania, Singapore, Ukraine, the United Arab Emirates, the United Kingdom, and of course, the United States. There we are. Mm. So, Ralph, you've got some more Artemis goodies, though, for us. Goodies or baddies? I'm not quite sure here. Mm. Um, this, kind, <laughs> this one kind of divides opinion, but new spacesuits have been selected for the Artemis Moon program. Um, and if you've been keeping up with this, you'll remember that these moon suits were already shown off at a NASA press conference in 2019. Mm. Well, NASA have done a reversal in light of their Inspector General stating that despite $420 million being spent since 2008, NASA still won't have two spacesuits ready for the planned 2024 landing. Now, that 2024 <sighs> deadline dropped back to 2025, and we've just heard that a recent delay to one of the ground platforms for the rocket 
is pushing that back to late 2026. So in all likelihood, that's early 2027 that you're going to have the first moon landing, but or human moon landing anyway. But that's still not enough time for that NASA moon suit to develop two for the people that will go down to the surface of the moon that they started in 2008, which is just crazy <laughs> when they've got Seems all the money so. they I... want, they've got all that history and all that time as well. I bring you back to my earlier scepticism about the time frame. <laughs> of that's, that's all I'm going to say. Is I, yeah. I feel justified in my scepticism yeah. of the time frame. I think you're right. Yeah. Now, I don't want to get all grungy, but whenever I see footage of the Navy divers opening up the Apollo capsules after the moon landings or ISS astronauts getting out of their spacesuits after a spacewalk, I can't help but think, damn, that rank smell is going to hit those divers or fellow ISS dwellers like a sledgehammer because that mm. stink must be <laughs> unbelievable. But I can guarantee that that smells nothing like the fear on the NASA spacesuit program executives right now. Because <laughs> after taking so long that you know much of the tech in the suit will now be old and they still can't build enough suits to meet the ever-delaying timeline for returning humans to the moon, mm. They've ditched the half billion dollar project and awarded an initial three point five billion dollars for two companies, two companies showing how fearful they are that one might not deliver to build new spacesuits for NASA to rent. Oh, <laughs> uh, oh. oh my God. Nothing says late <laughs> stage capitalism like astronauts walking the moon in rented spacesuits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now, despite the musky one chirping up on Twitter that he'd solved NASA's moon suit problems, NASA ran a tender and awarded the contract to Collins Aerospace and Axiom Space. Now, Axiom might sound familiar from a recent podcast episode because they're building commercial modules for high fee paying holidaymakers to stay at the International Space Station. And perhaps crucially, they're offering to trial these spacesuits to allow space tourists to go on their own spacewalks. So that's kind of like, you know, you get a bit of trials thrown in as well, and then they can be tested before even they're used on the Artemis missions, and, you know, they can learn some tweaks and things like that. Collins Aerospace is partnering with companies Oceaneering and ILC Dover, who were intimately involved in the Apollo moon suit, so they've got some experience in this area. But nothing reeks of failure to me like spending hundreds of millions of dollars with more than a decade's headwind, only to quickly heap billions out the back door mm. in the hope private enterprise can bail you out in just two years, or maybe three, or maybe four, but certainly not the 26 years NASA had. I, I, do, I, I do respect the axiom approach, though. It's not so much eat the rich as depressurize the rich. I like that. <laughs> There's a new hashtag and a t-shirt there, isn't there? Yeah, depressurize <laughs> the rich. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, the next story from me comes back to the musky one because SpaceX have been given permission to resume Starship launches. Ooh, or ooh, maybe ooh. they not. We don't know because astronomy and space exploration news always drops a day before we release the podcast and after we've already recorded. Yeah. So... <laughs> It might just be that the environmental assessment of the damage that the giganticest rocket could cause has been delayed again, and we have to wait longer to watch the most expensive explosions the world has ever seen. Not following that flippy floppy sentence? Well, <laughs> for anyone watching those hugely entertaining launches of the Starship top section last year, you'll have noticed that SpaceX have stopped launching them, and that's because they're quite content with how that went after one touchdown rather than smashing down. So the next steps have been to develop and test the giant reusable booster with 33 rocket engines that will propel the Starship into space. Except they've not been able to test them because those 33 engines are so ferocious that Texas thinks it might damage the natural environment and wildlife habitats, mm. and well, it might. Now that means SpaceX have been waiting for months to hear if their application to test the booster rockets at Boca Chica can go ahead. Each time they get close to a decision, there's been a delay for more community consultation. But we think this is probably 
the last delay before the FAA gives a thumbs up or a thumbs down two days ago. So as you're already listening to this in the future, (laughs) you possibly already know. So why do I mention this? Well, because after the approval to launch, the first booster is already teed up to launch on a near orbital flight test with the Starship atop the booster and new thermal protection tiles on the spacecraft to see if they can launch and land the booster as well as the orbital spacecraft. It's tall order because this is the largest rocket ever launched. But after Mm. all the delays, Musk will want to get back to blowing shit up as soon as possible. If he doesn't, sorry, didn't get the approval and it was declined, he already has plans to do the test launches from the new orbital launch facilities he's building at the Kennedy Space Center. The launch Mm. tower is close to being erected at the Cape, and although it will take even more time to build, it won't take as long as it did in Boca Chica because they've already learned how to build these ground facilities once before. So, Mm -hmm. too long didn't read. If SpaceX got FAA approval to launch, we can expect tons more exciting pyrotechnics to watch all this year and next. If they didn't, we'll have to wait a few months more while they expedite the building of their launch facilities in Florida. But either way, 2023 is going to be explosive. (laughs) <laughs> there's going to be a lot, a lot of fuel spent. Yeah. And yeah. not all of it achieving orbit. No. It's, no. And it's going to be so entertaining either way. Yeah. Yeah. It's win win. It's win win yeah. on that one. Yeah. Uh, but the environmental damage will be massive. So, you know. yeah. Yeah. Bound to be. Just like it is at the Cape. You know, that's in the, I think, Merritt Island Wildlife Refuge. Mm. And, you know, I think because it was the 60s or 50s when they built it, they just ploughed through all, all the regulation kind of thing. But it'd be a different mm. matter in Boca Chica, although it is Texas. So who knows? Who knows? <laughs> right. For our big news story, it's, um, mm. well, it's an interesting, it's a, it's a discussion really. NASA have announced that they're going to look into unidentified flying objects in a serious way and they're going to put yeah. a team together to look at this and i suppose my discussion point this question this question is is this a sensible sort of let's answer this once and for all let's put that question out there and get the answers and put some science into this and say look you know here's, here's the evidence yeah. or, and and now shut up or essentially i think part of the idea or is it red meat to the conspiracy nutters that even NASA are taking this seriously <laughs> and are putting a whole team spending money and time and effort and facilities on this? And actually, is it then go that sort of double bluff thing? There'll be one people saying, "Oh, well, look, it's the double bluff now." Now they're trying to hide behind this that they, they're they're trying to be mm. honest and they're just they're just covering it. All. What do we think, guys? Honestly, the conspiracy theorists will have a field day whatever happens this is true it, uh, it, it's just like if nasa refused to look into it then it's like oh well they won't look into it because they know that they can't reveal the truth you know and then if they do look into it then nasa is going to be accused of hiding stuff because oh it took them five years to release this report it took them 10 years to release this report mm-hmm. it's like oh you know some of this data is like redacted and whatever happens all of the conspiracy theorists are going to just have a complete field day with this but actually i because when i first saw this i was like i can't believe that nasa are actually looking into ufos but now that i've kind of thought about it i'm like well actually maybe if a full-on space agency like nasa and ESA does it at least maybe if they come out and say no this is definitely this aircraft this is definitely this balloon Mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. then it'll put some of these to bed because it's you know someone with some gravitas actually saying yay or nay well presumably nay to all of them i mean (laughs) you know (laughs) presumably uh, like you know they're not actually gonna find the uh ufo but why now why why what's i I found this very interesting kind of announcement so in a way sort of come out of the blue a little bit and actually, I don't know. It struck me as it was something I would expect, if I'm perfectly honest, under the last regime in the United States. Rather well, I than seem the to remember, one. Paul, that I think this was initiated by the last administration and mm. it's taken so long to come through as, as something. And this administration has not bothered to quash it. I could be wrong on that, but that's what I think mm. has happened with this because it's a Department of Defense initiative that. NASA are lending their expertise into as well. 
Yeah, because I mean, some of this came out of things like um, I think Gimbal and things like that, which were those videos, those U.S. Navy videos that um, sort of cropped up in the last ten years or so of of kind of infrared image sort of film taken on F-18s and things that were, were sort of yeah. allegedly sort of chasing these unidentified things, and they've all been thoroughly debunked. Mm. Um, you can find dozens of YouTube channels that kind of debunk these things and, and it's all about the sort of you know relative position of aircraft. They're probably chasing distant airliners and things like that. Um, but you can get disorientated on, on thermal cameras and things at high speed. But those videos particularly seem to have sort of stuck in the consciousness um, of late in America, especially. And, and Well, I think really... they've got a bit more validity or credibility because mm. they're coming from military airframes and it's on, it seems to be unexplained. But then, mm. you know, I think also, you know, you have to disentangle un unidentified flying objects from alien craft because an unidentified yeah. flying object is just something that looks like it's flying and you don't know what it is, you know, and that mm. can be yeah. me throwing a Frisbee in the air or it could be you lighting mm. a Chinese lantern or it could be, you know, a speck of dust that's on a, uh, a helicopter sensor that looks like it's something that's flying in unison. Um, and most of those things are just, most of, you know, yeah. the, the objects that, that we discover are things that are as prosaic as that. And that's also why, you know, they're so grainy and so poor quality. I think I think we've had a massive increase in drone um, sort of mm. misidentification. Yeah, unsurprisingly, yeah. Which has it sort of led to a, a recent increase in kind of UFO reports and things because mm. we've got these flying drones flying around. And particularly, again, I know the US Navy um, suffered a sort of series of, of sort of drone, I don't want to say the, the word attack because attack is the wrong word, but the, a series of drone incidents where the, the sort of the, the drone was unidentified and its source was unidentified and and kind of what its intention wasn't identified. Mm. Um, and, you know, sort of a series, series of US Navy ships kind of got buzzed and things like that by, by uh, drones. They, they couldn't work out where they'd come from. And I think this has just sort of put fuel on the fire of, of various sort of conspiracy theories and yeah. ideas about UFOs. So I think as well with the pandemic, I think conspiracy theories have just gone wild. No, oh, do you think so? And, and there's been scientific research that's connected, you know, extreme periods of stress, so wars, mm. pandemics, with conspiracy theories mm. being mm. more regularly mm. believed, um, you know, more widespread. Mm. Yeah. And so I think maybe actually having someone like NASA looking into what is a conspiracy theory hotspot, mm. you know, mm. UFOs, mm. it might actually help to quell some some of it because i mean there are so many programs on telly now mm -hmm. which are you know is is this a ufo this. Mm -hmm. you know it, there's so so many of them and you know it's nearly all of the programs you know you get to the end of it and it'll say like no this is definitely not a ufo because mm -hmm. xyz but then sometimes they're like oh we're, we're undecided we're, we're going to leave this open because we can't confirm it either way and that just like adds fuel to the fire because it's, so I just I feel like maybe it sounds bizarre and that's sort of taking this on but actually I think it might be good yeah I don't think it's, it's going to make a difference to diehard believers of alien visitations yeah. but yeah. Uh, one of the interesting things that that I read was that uh, just to put a, a bit of meat around this so um, they're expecting to get started around about November on this um, and it's going to take about nine months. So by the end of summer next year, you know, we might be in a position to see some kind of reporting on this, which mm. would be quite interesting to see. But one of the challenges that NASA have got and what they're hoping to bring to this is that challenge of the paucity of data so that, you know, there aren't very good reports mm. or credible reports of um, what um, uh, I think that they're, they're calling it unidentified aerial phenomena now. That's right. Yeah. yeah. UFOs. In the hope to get away from, you know, that UFOs are aliens mm -hmm. kind of thing. But it'll just change, you know, people will just refer to alien craft as unidentified aerial phenomena soon anyway. Yeah. But they, uh, NASA are aware that the quality of data you've got is really poor because, you know, it's your redneck with their, their camera phone uh, looking at Venus or it's, uh, or it's, you know, a smudge that's on a camera lens of an F-18. Um, and things like that just mean that the data that you're looking at, it's really difficult for scientists mm. to actually pour over it and decide what those things are, because unless you mm. give an explanation for what it is, this still it's still kind of people will make devilment in those gaps. Yeah. So, you know, you have to you have to have good enough data to be able to decide what the what those phenomena mm. are 
so that you can put them to rest. Mm. And, that, and hopefully that's something that NASA can bring to bear on this with, you know, a lot of their sensing equipment, they have ground observations and things like that. But then I think also if NASA can turn around and say, we cannot say either way because the data is too bad and this is why the data is too bad. The fact that they will, you know, because people trust them to have, you know, the best knowledge, the cutting edge research. So if NASA say, we just can't do anything with this, then hopefully that angle will help quell yeah, hope so. some of it as well. Mm. Yeah. So we don't think uh, there's, there's been reported in the news that this is going to create sort of um, institutional sort of reputational damage. Um, this is this is actually probably a positive thing yeah. overall. I think so. I think so. Yeah, because you know, I feel like. At the minute, it's just like spreading like wildfire UFO conspiracy theory. So it would be nice if that's a kind of just stopped and said, no, hang on, we're going to look at it and we will tell you with mm-hmm. hardcore evidence. Like maybe it does need someone like NASA to just step in and be like, look, let us just, you know, assure you for, for certain, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's all good, credible scientists using every yeah. resource they can to get to the bottom of all the things that are outstanding, and that mm. can only be a good thing. Mm. Well, let us know what you think about any of these stories in the comments below, and there's more from us next week. <laughs>